Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Whistleblow. Whistleblower heroes, everyday heroes, and educators sharing the information you need to know here on Revolution Radio, and I'm your host, Ella. What is a whistleblower? A whistleblower is a person who makes public disclosures of wrongdoing, corruption, and crime. These courageous people often suffer retaliatory actions because of their disclosures. But in the end, many of these people are often the catalyst for needed change and are eventually lauded as heroes. So with me today, I have Angela Ellers, who alleges that her, uh, sorry, I'm having some problems today. Her husband was wrongfully convicted, and she's here to tell you about it. And let me give you a little information on her. She's a mother of two who has been fighting to free her husband from a wrongful conviction for the last 11 years. Angela has been writing letters and making phone calls to anyone from the commandment of the Marine Corps to the lowliest legal clerk in the military office trying to get someone to read and investigate all the injustices committed by the officer, officers under the Judge Advocate General. All her experiences are detailed on her blogs and can be found at www.militaryinjustices.blogspot.com and corruptmilitaryattorneys.com blogspot.com. So, Angela, I just want to say thank you for coming, and I'm going to turn it over to you, and maybe you can tell, maybe you can fill in any blanks as far as, um, is there anything in your bio that I missed, if you want to share? Uh, no, there isn't, and thank you very much for inviting me on this evening. I, I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, where would you like me to start, like, well, kind of well, beginning? Well, let's start a little well, let's start at the beginning, like where you grow up and how you met your husband. You know, give them a little background information so they understand your relationship and, <laughs> and how you two were uh, brought together. Sure. Um, well, I grew up here in, in Minnesota, which is where I'm at now. Um, I met Eddie in June of 2004 in the Minneapolis airport. Um, I was flying with my mom down to watch my brother graduate at MCRD uh, San Diego. And... Um, Eddie was on the same flight as we were, and we ended up hanging out because our plane got rerouted. Um, so that's kind of how I met him. We went to Tijuana together and hung out down in San Diego for a couple of days. Uh, and then he uh, he left to go to Iraq shortly after that he was deployed. So we kept in contact while he was over there. Um, I ended up moving over to to from Minnesota to California before he came home, um, and we got engaged and got married and had two kids. <laughs> what year was this? So, um, June of two thousand and four is when I met him. Okay, great. And so, can you tell me about you know what he did for the military and how long he'd been in the military? But you know, before you met him. Yep, yeah, um, he originally enlisted in the Marine Corps. In May of two, uh, May of 1998, actually, um, and he was his MOS was uh, 0351 in, infantryman. Um, when I met him, he was a corporal, and he I can't remember exactly what he did in the military, but he he came back from Iraq a sergeant. They he got promoted while he was over there, um, and then he was. Uh, stationed at Marksmanship Training Unit at uh, Camp Horno, northern end of Camp Pendleton in, in California, um, where he worked at before he was convicted. From the time that he came back from from Fallujah until he was convicted, that's where he was stationed at. So, okay. And he so, did marksmanship training out okay, there. Okay, he did. And so maybe we can forward a little bit, fast forward to what exactly happened prior to this whole drama that occurred or this, this horrible experience? Um, well, it started actually in June of 2004 when I met him. Um, end of May, beginning of June 2004, his ex-wife, Gloria Johnson, took her two children down to go visit uh, Paul and Stacy Skavranko in South Carolina. Um, Eddie and Gloria had been separated. So they Gloria had moved from California back over to the East Coast. She went down to go visit the Skavrankos, left her kids there for the weekend. Um, and that's when all these allegations came out uh, where he was accused of, of sexual assault um, of Hannah Skavranko. Um, and Paul and Stacy, you know, started saying all these things and went to NCIS and kind of snowballed from there. But it originally started end of May, beginning of June 2004. Okay, so what happened at that point, and how did you find out? And how did he find out? 
Well, he he got a call. Um, well, first, when it was reported, he got a he got a call from his ex wife Gloria on his cell phone saying, you know, hey, um, you know, my friends are accusing you of of this, and and you're you know you're going to get paid back or whatever for for all the the pain you've caused me, and then kind of you know hung up. Um, and he he hadn't told me about any of this, obviously, you know, because I had first, you know, just met him then. Um, so he deployed with his unit and they didn't contact him like NCIS. Nobody contacted him when he was deployed. January of 05, he came home. He was contacted by NCIS and told that he had to go to um, the NCIS building at Camp Pendleton. Um, he did that in April of 2000, 2005. Um, he talked to investigators, offered to take a polygraph, continued to deny any wrongdoing whatsoever. Um, and they, they put that all in their, their report. So he thought everything was, you know, kind of said and done. Well, about a month later, month and a half later, um, end of May of 2005, he was called back to NCIS to do the polygraph where he met uh, Special Agent Eric Muhlenberg who administered a polygraph for 12 hours, held him there, um, and, and coincidentally admitted on the stand, because Muhlenberg testified against Eddie, um, that he violated Eddie's Miranda rights. When Eddie requested an attorney, he continued to interrogate him. Um, he, he apparently, well, they say that he didn't pass the polygraph, but they can't find any of them. Um, and CIS has, after all these years, been unable to locate it. Uh, but there is a document by Muhlenberg that says pass inconclusive pass. And that was for the three polygraphs that he admitted um, into to evidence against Eddie. It's actually in the record of trial, which it's not supposed to be there. Um, but yeah, but it, it's, it's kind of a, a big mess. Kind of going back a little bit. So Memorial Weekend 2004, Eddie's um, ex-wife's kids were, were visiting. Randy Hester is his former stepdaughter. She was about 13 at the time. She was in South Carolina with the Skavrankos, Paul, Stacy, Hannah, and I can't remember the son's name, um, was visiting with her brother for the weekend. And Stacy, the mother, went to Han or went to Randy and said, hey, Hannah's been, you know, touching herself lately. Why don't you go and have a chat with her? So Randy, not, you know, thinking anything of it, went to Hannah and said, you know, hey, what's going on? Why are you touching yourself? And Hannah, and this is in Randy's NCIS statement, um, Randy said that she questioned Hannah and Hannah said, well, he keeps, he's, he touched me. And if I tell my mommy's going to be mad, right? Mm -hmm. Not mommy and daddy, just mommy is going to be mad at me if I, if I tell who did it. So Randy said, you know, hey, we, we need to talk to your mom. We need to tell your mom what's going on. So Randy pulled Hannah into the living room and Stacy said, what's going on? Randy said, Hannah, you have to tell her. So Hannah says, he touched me and he did this to me and he did that to me, right? Mm -hmm. And and Stacy says, who did this to you? And Hannah's like, I can't tell you who told me. You know, I can't tell you. They told me not to tell because... No, you'll get mad at me. And Stacy, right in front of Randy, said, Mr. Eddie did this to you, didn't he? That's how Eddie's name was brought up into this whole mess. And Randy told NCIS that she witnessed Stacy say this. And NCIS never investigated it further. Like, why would Stacy tell Hannah to say it was Eddie? We don't know. We've never gotten a straight answer. So... After that, um, Stacy said that she called her husband, Paul Skavranko, who was a religious program specialist in the Navy. Um, he says in his sworn statement to NCIS, he says that he went to his commanding officer and said, hey, my, my daughter says she's been sexually assaulted and raped and all this stuff, and I, I've got to go home. So they let him leave work. He got home at about 1.15, 1.30 in the afternoon. He proceeded to question his daughter for several hours by herself. And then at about 4.45, he left to go to the hospital, which is a red flag right there. Why not take your kid to the hospital right away? You know, mm -hmm. like 
as a parent <laughs> or just, you know, anyone, if your kid is saying something happened, you take them in right away. You don't sit and question them for hours. So he says, yeah, you know, I took her in and I talked to the officer of the day. I spoke to staff members, told them what she was saying, that she had been sexually assaulted and this and that. I signed her into the emergency room. They took her vitals. Now, anybody that has ever been to a hospital, whenever you get in there, they, there is a, re a record of you being there, okay? Whether you're just signed in and signed out, there is a record of you being in that hospital. So he goes into all this detail about how he was there and sitting there for hours. And and Hannah says, no, Mr. Eddie didn't do anything to me. And and, he, and no one had come in for these, these hours, he says, that he was there. Because remember, he got there at like 5 o'clock-ish, right? So he said it was like 8, 30, 9 o'clock at this point. Nobody did anything for him. They told him at one point that they wouldn't. Um, do a sexual assault screen on her or anything. So he signed her out of the, the the Naval Hospital and he took her home. Now this is in Paris Island, okay, South Carolina. And he said, I took her, I signed her out and I took her home. He then called friends and family and then called NCIS. So the next day they went to him and his wife, Stacy went to NCIS, gave their sworn statements, which don't match anything that that Hannah says happened, okay? So that's kind of how everything got started. Now, when Eddie was convicted, we didn't know about any of this stuff. We didn't know about Randy's statement. That all came like after after he was convicted is when we started looking into and investigating what happened, what led to his wrongful conviction. Mm -hmm. So I myself made a lot of phone calls, wrote a lot of letters, got a lot of information from the Judge Advocate General's office. Um, got this this file that they sent me. Can I interrupt that had just Randy for a second, state. and maybe we can get back to that? What exactly sure. is the process of convicting an alleged criminal? Just so people understand. In the military, they have to prefer charges. So there's, there's, they get the report, like NCIS will get the report, and then the report, they make the report, then it goes to the command, and then the command decides if they're going to go forward with charges or if they're just going to drop it. So they went to NCIS. It was preferred back in 2004. It was, they call it a preferral of charges. They preferred the charges, and then they just kept adding on, like they were far reaching on it. So they kept adding things into it. And then it goes to the commander. The commander says, yes, there is enough evidence to go forward or no, there isn't. So it went to the commander. The commander said, yep, there is enough evidence here based on the, the statements that were given. And um, you can go go forward and start doing the, the arraignments is what, what they did. Mm -hmm. Now, within the military, there is speedy trial rights, just like in the civilian world. Um, in the military, you have 120 days from the date of the preferral of charges to either get somebody into a courtroom and get them convicted, or you have to drop everything. All of this mess started in June of 2004. They didn't actually convict him until August of 2007. I way see. over the timeline. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, way over the timeline. Um, but that's how it works. It has to go through the command. Um, the commander's staff judge advocate gives their opinion. They're like a, a they're like a, um, they're an attorney, but they're, a, a, oh God, I can't even think of the name of it. They, they just, they give their advice, their opinion on what should be done with the information provided is what it is. Um, and that's how the military justice system works. And then you're brought before a tribunal, you know, a court martial, whatever. And then, um, you're either convicted or you're not. So, oh, and if you are convicted, yeah, and if you are convicted, you can spend, well, Eddie was up for the death penalty because they put rape on there. He could have gotten the death penalty mm. because of this. Yeah, so. Thanks for the so explanation yeah, there. Works. Okay, so we'll fast forward back to you stumbling upon a file. Yes, so um, what happened was is we didn't have, like the, the defense attorney, uh, Lieutenant Michael Malakowski, he he didn't really give us a whole lot of information about what was going on. You know, Eddie was asking questions, and Mal Lieutenant Malikowski wouldn't wouldn't talk to us. 
So after Eddie was convicted, I, I went home. I came back to Minnesota and I started asking questions like things didn't make sense to me. Things that happened at the trial did not make sense. So I started asking questions. I contacted the judge advocate general's office. They sent me this, this file that was all screwed up. Um, and, and Lieutenant uh, Malakowski had given me some paperwork while I was in California where he was convicted. And my mom and I sat on my living room floor for days and put together paperwork, like matching things up statements. And that's where my, I think it was actually my mom found Randy's Randy's uh, NCIS statement that was done in June of 2004. And your mom had no uh, doubt that you were telling the truth. Yep. My mom, like my mom was in California with us. She was babysitting the kids at our hotel while I was at the court martial for my husband. My mom was there. She drove out there with me. And you never doubted the story for even a second yourself? Nope. Not once. Okay. Well, you know him. Yeah, I, I never, my husband, number one, he can't, the man can't lie. <laughs> He's very bad at lying, even about just little things like, no, I put the toilet seat down. No, you didn't. You know, like things like that, just stupid little things. He cannot lie. Um, he, he's very bad at lying. <laughs> he ends up, he ends up ratting himself out at some point, but no, it never, never crossed my mind that he, he did this ever, never, because it's not in his nature. It's not in his nature. Um, Didn't, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, like there, there's just certain things you can tell about people when you, when you meet them. And he, he just, he's not, he doesn't have that personality to deceive someone. Were there any family members on either side that were, that believed uh, these allegations? On, on, in my family. Oh yeah. Um, not my immediate family. No, my brother, my sister, my mother, uh, right. my grandparents, my aunts, um, uncles never believed for one minute that my, my husband did this. Um, and same on, on his side. Uh, I do have one uncle who I'm not particularly fond of anyway, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, who, who made a comment one Christmas and my grandfather told him, you know, put him in his place and said, you need to, to, you know, watch what you say to her. So, um, I don't really talk to that uncle, so I'm not concerned about that <laughs> right so, but no we, most of the people that I speak to are behind me 100% especially when they they read online what happened and they can see the documentation themselves right okay so maybe we can you know get back to more evidence that you were acquiring sure um, so anyway so they the June of 2004 Paul and Stacy, they went to NCIS. They did their statements. NCIS said, okay, well, um, she's saying that she was raped. She said that she was sodomized. She said that um, that that all she was she was Hannah kept saying all these things about how he he raped her and there was blood everywhere and this and that, right? So so NCIS in the middle of June of 2004, they had Hannah go in for a forensic interview. Okay where she went to NCIS, they videotaped it. I actually have the video. It was given to me um, by my husband's former attorney, um, that I, one that I hired after his conviction. Um, when he was no longer the attorney, he turned over everything, and I have it. In that video, you, you can clearly see she's sitting there with her, her, the NCIS agent, and she's saying, yeah, Mr. Eddie, he threatened me, um, threatened to kick and punch me. He put his penis in my mouth and, and the, the guy is like, well, what did it taste like? She's like, it tasted like a banana. And then he put this black glue and she'd grab a marker on his penis. And, and then he put his penis in my vagina and there was blood everywhere. But this was the part that really got me. She turned to the, the NCIS agent and said, and Miss Gloria, walked in and saw Mr. Eddie cleaning up the blood and told him to get out because Miss Gloria saw everything that he did. Hmm. So Miss Gloria is Eddie's ex-wife. Okay. I see. So, yeah. So the NCIS knew about, about Hannah saying that Gloria saw all this and, and 
told Mr. Eddie to leave the house in June of 2004. So a couple of weeks later, NCIS went to Gloria's home in North Carolina. They interviewed Gloria. They interviewed her mother, Donna Kerr. They interviewed her daughter, Randy Hester. They even interviewed her son, Samuel. And right off the bat, Randy said, I don't believe that Eddie did what Hannah is saying that that happened. I don't believe it because I saw Stacy or I, I was there when Stacy said, Mr. Eddie did this too, because Hannah didn't say anyone's name. Uh, Gloria went on to say, you know, I don't, I don't believe it either. You know, I, I don't think he he's capable of this. And she was married to him as well. And she's like, no, he, he did. I, he did not do this. His mom or her mom even said, you know, no, nope, uh, we don't believe Eddie did this. So, so NCIS knew while he, they were there that Hannah had accused Gloria of witnessing the sexual assault. She was never questioned about it at all. And this is in 2004, June of 2004. Never questioned once. So NCIS keeps, you know, doing their, their investigation and they keep piling on more things, um, trying to, you know, like, like put as many charges against him, hoping that one of them will stick when they get him into court. So they, he, he does, you know, comes back home from Iraq. He is promoted to Sergeant while he's over there. He, um, he goes to NCIS in April of 2015, uh, spoke to, uh, Art Spafford and, uh, Laura Mers offered to take a polygraph. May of 2005, he goes to NCIS and there is no no record of the polygraph at all, except for Muhlenberg saying that he didn't pass um, and that he gave, uh, Muhlenberg got on the stand, NCIS agent Eric Muhlenberg got on the stand and said that Eddie gave a full confession, but there's no record of a confession. There's nothing. Hmm. Do you think it's some kind of conspiracy against him? I think with the pushback from Congress, what happened was, is they treated Eddie as a number rather than a human being. They wanted the numbers coming out of Camp Pendleton to say that they were tough on sexual assaults. Okay, I see. And so you guys I, have no idea why his stepdaughter would come forth and say these type of things. It wasn't his stepdaughter. It was his best, his wife's friend's daughter. It wasn't his stepdaughter. That's right. Sorry yep. about that. Yeah, mm. that's okay. His his former stepdaughter, Randy Hester, came forward and said, he didn't do this. As a matter of fact, when when we went to trial in August of 2007, um, August 20th, 2007 was the first day of trial. Now, we went into that courtroom and Paul got on the stand, Stacy got on the stand. Stacy's Stacy, her testimony was impeached. She was found to be lying right on the stand. Um, the judge impeached her because she couldn't keep her dates straight on when she, because she says, why? Well, I know when, when the sexual assault happened, cause I, I left Hannah to be babysat by Eddie and, and Donna was Donna, Gloria's mother was sleeping on the couch and, and I left her over there so I could take a nap and, and he brought her back and she, she just looked sad and said that she wanted to come home. So he brought her home. Well, Gloria was on the stand and said, no, uh, Eddie was, has never been alone with Hannah ever. Um, he's never babysat her. And in fact, the dates that they were giving for the supposed sexual assault, because they, the prosecution tried to say it happened multiple times. Hannah got on the stand and said, no, it only happened once, but she couldn't remember what happened or who was there. So she had already changed her story. Um, Gloria said Eddie was never alone with Hannah, but Stacy's saying, oh no, she's, she's, he's babysat her. And Gloria's like, no, that, you know, never happened. So Stacy got impeached. Um, Paul Skavranko, he got on the stand and he was like, you know, I took her to the hospital and, and they refused to treat her. And, and he, you know, kept going on and on about how he was so distraught and, and, and upset because this happened to his daughter and, and whatnot. Well, we found out he never even took her to the Naval Hospital. He, he, he wasn't even there. There is no record 
in her medical record or at the hospital of him being there, that that family, anyone in the Skavrenko family being at the hospital, he said he went to in June of 2004. There's nothing. They lied. He lied about taking his kid there. Um, but what, what really hit home was when Gloria said the defense attorney, Lieutenant Malakowski, he got on the, he got Gloria when she was on the stand, got up there and he said, you know, so what would you say if, um, if Hannah said that you witnessed this sexual assault, right? And Gloria's like, I didn't witness anything. And if Hannah is saying that, then Hannah is being untruthful. So right there, that automatically should have casted a doubt as to whether Hannah was telling the truth at all. But no, it didn't. The judge judge didn't care. Um, so while we were there, you know, like they, they went through, they did their, the prosecution took the stand for all their witnesses um, the first day, which was just Gloria, Stacy, who was impeached, Paul, Hannah, um, Samuel Hester took the stand. Now, Randy did not testify against Eddie. And and I always wondered why she didn't. Um, because her her statements, you know, now having known what, what really happened, her statements would have been beneficial. So the prosecution didn't let Randy get on the stand. And Randy, apparently, from what I've gathered from Gloria, because I've spoken to Gloria, um, Randy would not get on the stand and let her words be twisted. She knew what, what happened. She could remember parts of it, not all of it, but she wasn't going to get up there and lie. She was not going to lie on the stand against Eddie because she knew it was a lie what these people were saying. And I suspect the defense attorney even knew about it because Malakowski interviewed Randy the night before the first day of trial. He knew what she was going to talk about. So yeah, it, it didn't make any sense, but when, so he, we, we were leaving the court on that first day after the, the defense or the prosecution rested, we were sitting in the parking lot and my mother-in-law and I were, were sitting on the back of my truck and my father-in-law, um, family friend, John, who was out, who had been flown out by the defense as a witness, um, as a, a character witness. And my husband were standing around and the prosecuting attorney, John, I, guess, I think it's Edward Yancey Ellis. He practices under the name Yancey Ellis right now. He walks up to our, our group, um, and goes over to, to Lieutenant Malakowski and says, uh, you know, like, congratulations, you won. I don't have a case. And we're all sitting there like, what the heck just happened? You know, like, what's going on? So we're, we're listening. And Lieutenant Malakowski kind of grabbed him and started dragging him down the, the parking lot towards uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Clay Plummer and was yelling at him the entire time. Like, don't ever come up and say that in front of my, my, um, my client again. Don't ever say anything like that again. So, you know, my mother-in-law and I are like, what, you know, what's going on? So when Lieutenant Malakowski walked back over, we questioned him and he said, oh, no, it was nothing. And he turned to my husband, he handed him a piece of paper and said, pack like you're going to the brig tomorrow. Now, this is before the defense had even put on a defense at all, right? Like we hadn't even put anyone on the stand yet in, in, in Eddie's defense, no one. And they're already telling him to pack like he was going to the brig the next morning. So the next morning we, we went in to the courtroom and there was the defense had an expert witness, a Dr. Philip Esplin. He is like world renowned for his studies of sexual assault. He's a, a what they call a Daubert expert witness. Now, the day before, when we were at the court, he was jumping uh, in, up and down in his seat when Hannah was on the stand, and he was scribbling in this notebook. And I, I ran into him. I, I'm a smoker, and I'd been outside, and I ran into him, and I said, you know, hey, what? why were you so excited when you were in there? Because he was sitting in a row ahead of, of all of us. Um, and he's like, I, I, I have some things I have to talk to Lieutenant, Lieutenant Malakowski about, but they're good. She is lying. And I can prove she's lying. And I'm like, okay, you know, um, and that's pretty much all, all I knew, you know, cause that's all he had said to me. So I didn't really get what he was talking about. Cause I, I didn't, I understood what the charges were, but I didn't 
really understand the law or the military justice system at that point. So on August 21st, when we went, when we got to court, we were told to be there at about 8.15-ish in the morning. Um, he was missing. And we were in the defense room, and I, I turned to, to Lieutenant Malakowski, and I said, you know, where's, where's the, the doctor, uh, Dr. Esplin, from yesterday? You know, where is he? Oh, well, I told him he could catch a flight home last night. We're not going to use him. I'm like, excuse me? I'm like, what do you mean you're not going to use him? And he's like, he, he doesn't have anything that is beneficial to Edwin's case. And I'm like, well, that's not what he indicated yesterday when I talked to him. And he's like, don't, Malikowski's like, don't question my, my, um, how did he put it? Don't like, don't question his actions, right? Like, don't, how dare you question me <laughs> type deal. So I let it go. We walked into that courtroom. The judge said, you're guilty. Because he went with that. Malikowski convinced Eddie to go with the judge alone try a judge alone um, uh, court martial. Judge looked at Eddie and opened up the court, said you're guilty, gave us a 15 minute break. You must have been we went devastated in. to hear that as well as him. Oh yeah, he st he started crying immediately in in the courtroom. We went into the defense room, and and because they hadn't read him the sentence yet, but we went into the defense room. And I was, I was sitting in there. We were on the other side of the table um, a, a, along these windows that were, were in, the, in the room. And Lieutenant Malakowski walked in the door and he closed the door and he leaned against the wall and he had this smile on his face. And it's a smile I will never forget. And if I, if I could, I would have wiped that smile off his face right then and there. I, I actually did lunge at him over the table. My husband had to hold me down because I was, I was angry. I was like, why didn't you put on a defense? Because the, the judge opened the court and Malikowski said the defense rests. Didn't even put anyone on, on the stand. And the judge said, the, the verdict is guilty. I will read the, the I will decide the sentence after a, a short recess. And I, I remember, oh, I was so angry. I was crying and I was upset. And I was just kept thinking, how did this happen? How, how could this happen? The mom lied on the stand. They have no one to back up any claims. There is no physical evidence that anything happened to this little girl. Her mom and dad both said that they never, they, they, they never noticed any bruising, any marks on her, nothing. Okay. The, but how, how it happened, I have no idea. So then they gave him a 25 year sentence. Um, Lieutenant Malakowski handed my husband a piece of paper to read before the court. It was something that my husband had not written. Um, Malakowski had, had written it up and it was literally like, I'm apologizing for what I did type deal. Like he didn't do anything. Why would he apologize for something he didn't do? So we left the court that day. Um, I called my mom before I left the court because I still had to drive back to the hotel and my mom, I was so upset that my mom had me put John on the phone. Um, John was a, a fam is a family family friend, um, and uh, my mom told him to watch me to make sure that I didn't try to run them over in the parking lot because she was worried that I was going to do something to Paul, Stacy, and Hannah Skavrenko is mm -hmm. what she was worried about because I was I was angry I was upset I was suddenly a, a single parent I you know I I. I my whole life just went, you know, like, what am I going to do now? Literally. And my mom's like, just get back here. And then we got to get back to Minnesota and we'll figure everything out there. Mm -hmm. So I, I drove back to the hotel and John followed me in his car. Um, and we had to drive by the ranch house chapel, which is where we were married at Camp Pendleton. And I just, I broke down. I called my brother on the phone. Um, he was here in Minnesota and I was just crying and my brother's like, I'll start looking up stuff online. You, you just, you get back here, you get, you get mom, you get the kids, you get back here and you know, we'll, we'll start looking up stuff. So, um, they took him away to the brig. I was not allowed to see him before I left California. Um, they had him on a, a 72 hour hold or whatever. Um, but they would not let me, they would let me bring him money to put on his brig account 
but they would not let me see him. Actually, the guy that I had to talk to to give the money to, he felt really bad. Because he's like, you know, I, I wish I could, but I, I can't. They're still processing him. So August 21st, 2007, he was convicted, given 25 years. Mm. And I left Camp Pendleton a couple of days later. And I drove back to Minnesota with my 19-month-old son and 7-month-old daughter. And no money. I had to have my grandparents wire me money to make sure that I could make it home. Um, we got home. I got back to my, my Ida town home here in Minnesota um, that we were renting. And I had to start figuring out how I was going to, you know, raise my kids, pay the bills. So in the meantime of doing that, we had, I had this case file from Lieutenant Malakowski that he had given me. And my mom and I started putting it together um, on top of the, the paperwork that I'd gotten from the Judge Advocate General's office. And that's when we started really questioning everything. Like, how, where, where is, first of all, where is the record of Hannah being at the Naval Hospital, right? Um, where, where is it? So I, I got in touch with an attorney, Mike Eisenberg, um, who he contacted the, after I hired him, he, for the uh, the appeals process, he actually started questioning things, and, and him and I would go back and forth while I was, you know, I, at home or whatever. He would go back and forth, like, well, what about, you know, where's where's the the polygraph? First of all, we wanted to find the polygraph. Then it was, were they at the hospital? Then it was, um, you know, like if they weren't at the hospital, then where did they go? What other hospitals could they have gone to? Was the family advocacy program involved? The Department of Defense has a program called the Family Advocacy Program. Anytime that there is a sexual assault of anyone in the military or their, their family, the Family Advocacy Program is required to be involved. It's, it's by law, they have to be involved. Um, so we, we started questioning things. That's when my letter writing started. <laughs> so um, first thing we tried to do is get the polygraph. NCIS even to this day has said, they are unable to locate the records of the polygraph that Eddie supposedly took in, that, that he did take actually in, in May of 2005. They can't find the records, okay, number one. Number two, where, where is this confession that Eddie supposedly did this confession? Where is the confession? Well, Muhlenberg, Eric Muhlenberg, he said that he, he had video recording equipment there, but he didn't utilize it because his word should be good enough. Um, he, they've never proven that there was a confession ever. Um, Eddie refused to sign any paperwork while he was there. He requested an attorney. Muhlenberg admitted on the stand. I'm, I, he, he's like, I continued to question him until the duty driver arrived and picked him up. He was there for 12 hours. They held him for 12 hours and would not let him leave. Um, so we, we started gathering information. We found out right before the convening authority acted, which after you are convicted, your case goes to a convening authority. It has like 180 days to go to the convening authority. And the convening authority is your commander. Um, in this case, it was uh, uh, Lieutenant General Thomas D. Waldhauser. And um, Waldhauser looked over everything, all the paperwork we submitted, gave six years clemency. Now, between the conviction and and the convening authority acting, we went to the, the family advocacy program and said, have these people ever had any record with you? Paul, Stacy, Hannah Skavranko. They came back and said, no, there is no record in the family advocacy program information. It's And the paperwork I have is dated like February of 2008. Um, that no, there was no record as of February of 2008 after Eddie's conviction and after they the dad and said, you know, oh, I took her here and talked to this person. There's nothing. Um, NCIS reports, when we were looking through them, they, they don't match what they testified to at court. The stories changed. Um, Hannah's story changed. Her mother's story changed. Her father's stories changed. Her, her mom's story was completely impeached while she was on the stand. Uh, there was just, there was too many things that were not not right. So my cousin who lives in Southern California found that there was a, a guy, she was listening to a radio show and she found this guy 
uh, he's retired now, Lieutenant Colonel Colby Vokey. Um, and he was actually the head of Marine Corps West, um, which is the Western region. Um, he oversees all of the cases in the Western region of, of the Marine Corps. So like the whole West coast. And she got me hit or my, my brother who is still in the Marine Corps at that point, my brother got me his, his phone number. Um, I contacted him, had like a two hour long phone call with him. And I said, you know, this is what happened. Um, you know, like I know he was wrongfully convicted. I can prove it. I've got paperwork here that is not adding up to what they're saying it should. And it, it's not, their stories don't match what their original stories were. Like they've done a complete 180. It's, it's not, this is not right. And he said, you know, who were the, the NCIS agents at Camp Pendleton that were involved? And I said, um, Laura Mers, you know, an Art Spafford and an Eric Muhlenberg. And he's like, I'm going to stop you right there. And he said, if Eric Muhlenberg and Art Spafford were involved, you need to get your husband another polygraph. And I'm like, why? And he goes, because there has been issues with Muhlenberg and Spafford um, lying under oath on the stand. And so I'm like, okay. So my mother-in-law paid uh, uh, Paul Redden out of the San Diego Police Department, um, Lieutenant Colonel Vokey. He is, he's the one that, that actually snuck Eddie out of the brig, (laughs) um, for, for the polygraph. It was video and audio recorded. Um, I have the results from it. He took four polygraphs with this Paul Redden and he, and it was quality checked by four. It was either four or five other, um, other, uh, uh, what you call it? Experts, polygraph experts. He passed every single one of them. With flying Let me just colors. let you know that just so to, so you can kind of gauge the time. We have 15 minutes left, so I, I know oh, I wouldn't. okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fine. So, so anyway, so he passed his polygraph, So, but it's inadmissible in court, so we couldn't do anything with it. So fast forwarding, like kind of just to free up time here. Um, so I have been, ever since I, I started discovering these things, I mean, then there's, it's multiple, like the, I printed out the story that I actually wrote on the blog. It's like 20 pages long. And there are links to the actual documentation, the record of trial, the the polygraphs, the um, the letters sent to the judge advocate general, to the commandant of the Marine Corps, to the the secretary of the Navy. Um, all of it is there and and their responses. What they've said is these people, these attorneys didn't do anything wrong. They didn't withhold evidence. Yes, they did. They didn't falsify information. Yes, they did. They didn't, you know commit fraud upon the court. Yes, they did. So now he's out of the military appeals. Um, There really isn't a whole lot more that we can do at this point. Um, He, back in February, we submitted some paperwork back to NMCCA, the Navy Marine Corps Court of Appeals, um, which is like the first level court, to see if we could get his conviction overturned based on stuff that, that they refused to consider before. And I swear NMCCA is a joke. It is a complete joke. So in April, beginning of April, I wrote I wrote a few letters that I haven't really written. I used to write letters like it seemed like every week to the commandant, the judge advocate general, the secretary of the Navy, the Department of Defense inspector general saying, look, these people committed th- th- these crimes. Why? Why were they allowed to do this? Like, I just want an explanation. I want to know why they were allowed to do these things. Um, why Paul and Stacy were allowed to lie? Why, after Plummer and Ellis, the two prosecutors, once they found out because they were notified that they committed fraud upon the court, why didn't they go and report it? Plummer told me he was going to. He never did. Denies it to this day. Um, no, I'm not going to do anything. Well, yeah, you know what? You're going to have to. Um, at some point, they're going to have to. But what I did was in April, I went to. I wrote a letter. Um, several of them, but one of them in particular went to the Department of Defense Inspector General. Okay. The Department of Defense Inspector General, I said, look here, here's what happened. Here is the evidence I have against these attorneys and this military judge, because some of these attorneys are no longer in the military. They're private practice now. Okay. So they're practicing out in the public. They are defending and prosecuting public cases and they shouldn't be allowed to do that because of what they've done. Um, 
But I went to the DOD IG and I said, you, you know, look, I have this evidence. Here is my paperwork. Um, you know, I, I want something done. I want action. Um, I want action taken against these attorneys. I'm not waiting for you and hoping for you to do it. I am now demanding it. Um, I've also started contacting the attorneys and, and defendants or anyone that these attorneys have been associated with their cases. I have started contacting them. I am going to get a, a class action suit against the judge, the, the defense attorney and the two prosecuting attorneys and Eric Muhlenberg in NCIS. Um, because of, of the things that they have done that we discovered. So I wrote this letter. I didn't expect to hear anything back from any of them, okay? And I wrote to the DODIG, the Office of the Judge Advocate General, the Secretary of the Navy, and um, I can't remember the fourth one. But on April 19th, I got a response from the Department of Defense Inspector General. And in the letter that they wrote back, that he wrote back, um, he said, you know, you had to show three things. Like I had to show violation of uh, federal and federal laws and regulations um, that it would warrant that that because of these violations that it would warrant an investigation and that it was under the purview of the inspector general. Um, when he wrote back to me, he said all of my allegations and all of the paperwork that I, I supplied show substantial violations of federal law and regulations and that it is under the purview of the inspector general. He gave me a, a case number and he forwarded it over to the department of the Navy inspector general and the Marine Corps inspector general, and they are going to start doing an investigation. They've already started doing an investigation against everybody that was involved in Eddie's wrongful conviction. Well, that sounds like good news. Finally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this opens up the doors for a lot because when they, when they, when, when I got that letter that confirms that everything that is on that blog, cause I sent him copies of letters that, 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 and documentation that I've, I've amassed over 11 years now. Um, I sent him copies of stuff. It proves that what I'm, I'm not lying about it. I, this happened, you know, like he's not here because of this and that they did violate these laws. They did, you know, do fraud upon the court and they knew about it and they never corrected anything. And they, they're continuing to lie to this day. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Plummer, he's the head of Marine Corps West right now out at Camp Pendleton. He is overseeing thousands of cases. And because I now have the, the information to move forward with the, the IG's office, there are thousands of cases both in and out of the military that are going to be affected by this. When, when these people are sanctioned, um, I'm, I'm getting ready to file uh, ABA complaints um, with the, the copy of the letter from the IG, obviously, and the, the information that I have against these attorneys um, and, and the judge. Um, and I'm going to ask for them to be disbarred. I do not want them practicing law anymore. They should not be, be able to practice law. Um, just the other day, I sent out a couple of letters to the, the Department of the Navy Inspector General and the uh, Marine Corps Inspector General. And in my letters, I, you know, it's very nice, but firm. Um, I said, you know, literally, I want them busted down and booted out of the military. That's what I want to happen to these people. They ruined my husband's life. They took him away from myself and our children. Our kids didn't weren't even allowed to see him until they were five and six years old. They were babies when he was taken away. Was you know, he, they, what was going on while he was in prison? Because sometimes you hear that uh, prisoners who come in with convictions like this have the worst time of all in the system. He's a big guy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. He so he, he's, not, he's not little. Yeah. He's, he's not a little guy. He's a big guy. Um, he never had any issues. He's actually been a model prisoner. Um, never had any real, you know, any issues. Um, he, yeah, he, he's never, and, and the thing with prisons, they don't typically ask you about, you know, like what your conviction is. Um, but he has made friends while he's in there. He's got one gentleman, um, whose wife I think is actually listening <laughs> tonight. Um, who is helping him with the appeal stuff because I don't have time to sit and write out the appeals. Cause I, 
after he, he, we, I can't afford to continue paying for an attorney. I, I can't, I'm, I'm a single mom. I've got a mortgage. I got kids, you know, uh, house payment and car payments and children and animals. And I can't do it. But for a long time, I was the one writing all of his appeals that were being submitted to the court. I memorized pretty practically memorized the UCMJ. Just so you know, we have five more minutes. All right. Um, but yeah, he, he's, he's doing fine. He's here in Minnesota. We actually try to go up, um, at least once a month. Um, we're heading up there, not this weekend, but next weekend to go and see him. And, uh, and the kids are, are able to see him now, finally, since he got here in 2012, they've been able to have contact with him and he can get their pictures, which he was denied before. So, so now we're, we're just waiting for the inspector general to come back and see what happens from there. So I try to keep the blog up to date. Um, but, uh, but I haven't really been doing that lately, <laughs> but I do try to keep it up to date as much as possible. Well, you're busy. You gotta, you have children and you're really working on this, you know, this conviction. Yeah, it's it's hard. It ha it has not been easy. It has not been easy. But it could always be worse. Mm -hmm. You know, they they say that when your when your loved one is gone, you know, you you grieve for them, and we've grieved, but he's still alive. You know, that's the that's the the weird part about it. You know, we can grieve, but he's still alive. He's just he's gone. You know, um, it's going to be different when he gets out because he will come home at some point. I will get him a home. I will get him him out um, and get his conviction overturned. It's just a matter of when. And then Paul and Stacy, I'm going to push for them to be prosecuted and put in jail. That's what I want. I mean, that's understandable from your point of view. Yeah. Not, well, some people are like, yeah, you know, it's kind of vindictive, but it's no less than what they deserve. You know, they, they lied about it. So, how are your children doing? I'm sure they're not doing well. I mean, did they? I'm sure they've adjusted by now. Um, in the beginning, it was really hard, you know, because like he couldn't talk to them on the phone. Um, I remember an incident. I was in the bathroom. I had to lock myself in the bathroom because my son wanted to talk to his dad. He was probably about three, and he sat there screaming and crying and banging on the door. And I had to lock myself in the bathroom, so because I it it hurt that I had to tell him, no, you can't talk to your dad. You can't talk to him on the phone because he remembered him. He was 19 months old. You know, he remembered having a dad. Mm, heartbreaking. So what do you got going on in the future? Um, well, I am going to be working with the IG's office to um, come to a mutually beneficial conclusion, uh, which my demands are very simple. I want my husband out, obviously conviction overturned, uh, his rank restored. Um, as well as his back pay. Um, they can retire him out. He's coming up on 20 years in the Marine Corps at the end of this month. They can retire him out. That's fine. Uh, but then I do want some type of administrative um, uh, response with the, the attorneys and the judge. You know, something I want some kind of administrative action taken against them um, because I am going to continue to go through with the ABA um, complaints and 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 get them at least sanctioned, publicly sanctioned, so that if they are ever hired as an attorney, people will know. If you research your attorney, you will know what the, what has happened to them if they've been sanctioned, because they ruined my husband's life and his career. They ruined it. So, I think an eye for an eye. I think they should have their careers ruined. Personally. Again, I, I mean, I understand from your point of view. Yeah. So just, why don't we, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, you know, it's just, it's sad because he's missed out on a lot and he can't ever get those years back. And there's never going to be a, a, an explanation that the military is ever going to be able to give us that will ever fully, you know, like make him whole again. He's never going to get those years, those 11 years away from the kids. He's never going to get that back ever. And that's what's really heartbreaking. Well, people are resilient. I'm sure you found that out. It sounds like you have a lot of conviction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stay the course. My grandfather always said the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Well, by the time I'm through with them, the Marine Corps is going to think I'm throwing a bearing. And you might that's set a precedence too and kind of get them thinking to be a little more thorough and to, and to keep their documents. Yeah. Yeah. Factual. 
they did. Yeah, they destroyed everything. They destroyed when I tried to sue them a few years ago. They destroyed the video recordings from the the court martial because there were things missing out of the record of trial that would have been on the tapes. They destroyed them. I have the letter for that too. So, yeah, keep your records. You wanna, I did. Do you want to give your your websites again or your blogs so people can kind of stay up to date and see what's going on? Yeah, sure. It's uh, www.militaryinjustices dot blogspot.com is the main one and then um, corrupt military attorneys dot blogspot.com you can always search Sergeant Edwin Ellers at P-H-L-R-S and you will find me. Angela good luck thank you have a great evening Nicholson and a few good men. You can't handle the truth. Well, you can, and Event Horizons will give you those truths so when you're mad as hell and not going to take it anymore from that memorable scene in Network, you'll know just what to do. We will draw you in and become your news addiction at Event Horizons. Join us Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to noon Eastern Time at freedomslips.com at Revolution Radio. Our world team members are Dennis Fetcho, John Ilias, David Dunger, Hila Cass, MD, Melanie Richton, Jim Mars, Paula Harris, John Trallo, Maria Payan, Christopher Husser, D-O-D-D-S, Jonathan Orchard, and me, your anchor, Dr. Robin Falco. If, uh, you decide not to volunteer, it will not be held against you in any way. Sounds dangerous. It is. Very dangerous. Count me in. And that's right here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps. Studio B for Momentary Zen with host Zen Garcia at freedomslips.com, the people station. Take a look around, kid. What do you see? Homes being foreclosed. People working two, three jobs just to put food on the table and still drowning in debt. Don't get me wrong. This country is founded on great ideals and principles. They've all been ruined by the banks. Open your eyes to the banks that are robbing you. You know who my favorite president was? Who? Oh. Alice Jefferson. Because he saw all of this coming and tried to stop it. He fought the banks. JFK too, and they killed him for it. The banking institution is more dangerous than an army, he said. He also said that every generation needs a revolution, Jimmy. The American dream is just that, just a dream. 
War is a continuation of politics, only by other means. Politics is a continuation of economics by other means. This is our bank. This is our war. And this is our plan of attack. Banks have become an essential threat to our democracy. So consider this justice. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station on the Internet. Please help support this station so this battle can continue forward. Revolution Radio! The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... Jordy for the second half of the show. Before we get to his whistleblowing story, I would like to read his bio for you. Michael is the CEO of LabMD, a cancer testing laboratory. He has spent most of the last decade defending his company against charges that has had deficient cybersecurity practices. The early years of his entering and fighting Washington, D.C. are recorded in his book, The Devil Inside the Beltway. In doing so, he has become the only litigant to challenge the basic authority that underlies more than 200 enforcement actions relating to cybersecurity and online privacy that the FTC has brought over the past 15 years. Every one of the 200 plus litigants before him, including some of the largest company in the world, have settled with the FTC, creating an unquestioned, untested belief that the FTC has broad authority to regulate in these areas. Following oral arguments in June 2017 before a panel of the 11th Circuit of the Appeals, it seems entirely possible that he will prevail. In doing so, he may well topple topple key pillars of the FTC, cybersecurity, and online privacy edifice, successfully exposing and challenging the administrative state. So, welcome, Michael. Well, good to be here. How are you, Mona? I'm doing all right, doing all right. So, you know, maybe we can uh, start from the beginning of this, you know, all this stuff that had happened, and, you know, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you tell your story. Okay, so uh, 10 years ago, last February, I was in about the, I don't know, 18th, 19th year of having a medical laboratory that I founded, let's see, 1996, 2010, 14th year. And, um, and, And what we did, we were a private company that tested the tissue that physicians sent us for cancer. They really, it was a lab only for urologists. So we had blood, urine, and tissue that we tested for urologists all over the country through the miracle of FedEx and the internet. And the reason people used us was because our software was very unique and we could mm-hmm. direct things the right way for managed care. And we had top pathologists that only read that type of cancer because Different cancers read differently, so it's just like specialists versus, you know, generalists. So, is there anyway. any way you can? I'm sorry to interrupt you, really. Um, yeah. is there any way you can get a little closer to your mic because it's oh, so sure. important? I thought, yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. I, I'm sorry. Is that better? Uh, yeah, it sounds a little bit better. Okay, I don't. I, that's okay. So, um, what happened was the um, the phone rang out of the blue. And it was a guy named Robert Bobick. He called the company and said, "We have found." 9,000 of your patients in one file out in cyberspace. I'm the CEO of this company called Tyversa. And, you know, if you'd like us to fix it for you, we do that work. We want to let, you know, try and be really friendly. But we were so alarmed by all this that I just wanted to know immediately, how did you get it? What was the IP address? And, And he wouldn't tell us a single thing. So while he had a really friendly tone, That was the only thing friendly about him. He wouldn't give us any information. And, you know, in healthcare, we don't roll that way. So he really was just terrifying us. And you have to think about a decade ago when even the word breach wasn't in the lexicon. The only thing breach that people knew was a breach birth. There was no data security, privacy, hackers. People didn't know what that was. 
Uh, but we certainly knew because we were a medical lab and we were under HIPAA. So we were really alarmed and we uh, checked everything out as fast as we could. And uh, he sent us the file. And I had some sophisticated IT people with the company because this is what differentiates us the marketplace. And all our competitors are big, multi, multi-million dollar companies. And we're this little tiny company with 40 employees. So uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't believe him unless he proved it. He wanted $40,000 to remediate it. And I just told him to go away. And he kept emailing us all these types of uh, suggestions, uh, anxiety-inducing, friendly notices of other people that were leaking. And it was all through peer-to-peer networks. Well, we, well, we found, and I don't know if your listeners know what peer-to-peer is, if they remember what LimeWire was, but... It, we found an employee that had LimeWare on her workstation. We never believed that she even put it on there because the installer stub was in there two years before she even joined the company. But she was using, without authorization, LimeWire, listening to music, which was absolutely against the rules. And she was a billing manager. And the file was not out of the medical side. It was the billing side. So it didn't have patients' phone numbers in there or addresses, like, but it did have their social security numbers. And uh, so we cleaned that up. We didn't find it anywhere else. And for two years, even today, we never found the file out in cyberspace. So we just want him to go away. And he was emailing because I wouldn't talk to him. I wanted everything documented because I knew I come from a law enforcement background. Both my parents were police officers. and That's how they met in Detroit. So I knew that, you know, people don't believe you. They, 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 and they're, they're not going to say they don't believe you. They just sort of nod their head and smile, and walk away. So I wanted everything documented so people could be their own judge. So, um, that's what happened. I, I went and, um, I, I, we, we didn't pay him, want him to go away next. And he said he was going to call the federal trade commission. And in 2010, two years later, the federal trade commission calls us and starts a quote unquote, non-public inquiry. So this non-public inquiry turns out to be 11 pages, single spaced of all sorts of information that they want. And it, it really was backbreaking in the amount of data we had to give them. And we, because they would never tell us exactly what they're looking for, we just decided to dump truck everything on them because we were, felt like we were completely innocent. And we were also naive to, because we were in healthcare our healthcare investigators were healthcare professionals. What we didn't know is that the FTC is not full of technology professionals. It's just full of lawyers. Mm-hmm. And that's a very, very dangerous thing. So that, and most, so, so I started um, learning about the Federal Trade Commission because we certainly don't know who they are in medicine. And I started really, I mean, we had my entire life just really been medicine and sort of naive to the rest of the world. And I could not believe the powers that they had that seemed to go directly against what I was taught the government powers were limited to. But basically, they can accuse you of whatever they want to accuse you of, and they don't have to have any proof. And you have to spend the millions and the years to to prove that you're not guilty of that. It's a whole um, Kafkaesque, you know, guilty till proven innocent pay your way out of the game type of, of, of gun to your head. Uh, I, I really always say it's like the Sopranos go to Washington because it's just an unbelievable, shocking racket. And it scares people. So when you want to tell people what it is, I, people were then getting alarmed. You know, they were like, well, you must be wrong. Or that's, are you okay? Do you need a vacation? <laughs> and so I shut up about it. I didn't tell many people at all. So I didn't tell the employees because we, we thought they'd go away, but they, they went and dragged this on and on and on for three and a half years. And by that time, I had learned so much about the powers they had, that how Congress had developed these agencies, really starting with Woodrow Wilson. You know, people like to think it was Obama or something, but it really it's stunning how ignorant we are kept and made about our real federal government. Everything I say now, everything we're taught in the civics class, we might as well be reading um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. It's like a fairy tale because it's it's not it's it's a half truth. It's an incomplete story. It ends in like 1915, and everything about how the government changed after that isn't in the book. And 
the power of the government rarely comes pounding down on you personally. So there's a, a whole mass of people that are just kept ignorant. So I decided to write a book about this because I thought we were going to be destroyed. Um, I thought if I what they wanted me to do is they wanted me to make them go away by signing a consent decree that would be a 20 year contract with them that they could audit me every two years at my expense. And because they don't have a ton of official power other than the power to, to drain you dry and beat you up and keep you in court forever, they don't really have a lot of power to make you do anything specific but they can hold that gun to your head about how long they're going to bug you so that you agree to something. And so agreed to, I would, I refused to agree to a consent decree because when I saw, I saw what they did, what they do is they seduce these companies into these consent decrees. But what really happens is they put this press release out after that annihilates the company's reputation and makes the government look like a hero. And, and I would not participate because unlike, big companies that had been through this, like TJ Maxx or whatever, I was a cancer detection center, and that lie would destroy us. So I was like, well, I'm going to get destroyed one way or the other. Do I get destroyed by saying I didn't do it and no one believes me? Because no one believes you when you say you didn't do it, especially when you're a CEO of a company. People just do not believe you. Uh, or do I fight it? So I wrote the book. And I, I called it The Devil Inside the Beltway, and I wrote it like a novel because I learned that people need to have things in story. And the book came out, um, the, the trailer went out in the summer of 13, and within 24 hours, the FTC had gone to my website 72 times. Within three days, they announced they were going to sue me. They sued me uh, about a month and a half later. And five days after that, Tyversa, from that guy, Bobek, sued me as well for defamation before the book even came out. I just want to say real quick, that trailer is amazing. And it's, I hope it engages people. I hope that it creates interest for your book. Well, the book's done incredibly well. I mean, it, it has, I mean, I did not go through a publishing company because I knew they were going to water it down. I mean, I had to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. When it's it's easy for me to, to be believed now because Business Week did a whole profile on me a couple of years ago. And when things are in the press like that, there's a level of credibility. And but at that point, no one believed me. And I and I knew it had to be I, I say, you know, a spoonful of sugar has to make the medicine go down, because if you scream and yell and rant and boy, I did sometimes and I wanted to because it was an emergency. People don't see the flames that you're feeling. So they don't react that way. They kind of react like, shut up. <laughs> they don't react like, you know, they're not good to whistleblowers. I mean, you, you know, people are not good to whistleblowers. And people think from a distance, oh, whistleblowers, good for them. Well, how courageous. But in day-to-day -day life, most Americans are not good to whistleblowers. Because uh, initially, it's, it's, sometimes, uh, right. unless something good comes out of it, which sometimes it, eventually does. It does, but that I'm really speaking about that time. I mean, I was in a different situation. I, I was very successful. I had I was, you know, in my early fifties. I had the money to do this. I knew what I was signing up for. Most people are not in that situation. And and it is it, it you know, you have to be able to survive to when something good happens. And sometimes something good doesn't happen for a few years. And the reason this bothers me quite a bit is because it then discourages whistleblowing. It keeps people, it empowers the silencing of people that want to point out the wrong. And that I think we have to understand and have more respect for whistleblowers in the early stages of the process. And I'm not talking about tattletales. There's a whole difference in that, right? Because people yes. don't like tattletales and they don't like rat things and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking to people that really are inside situations that would have a unique perspective that no one else could see. And they've got the courage to come out and just call it out. And because that scheme they're usually whistleblowing on is harming usually the public. And what this guy was doing that was harming me, I found out, was he, he was actually uh, acting like a good guy. And he had chalked his advisory board full of all these uh, government people. General Wesley Clark, Larry Poneman, 
uh, Howard Schmidt, who was Obama's head, White House cybersecurity guy. So he had an air of credibility because, of course, he had those people on his on his team. So people would assume, of course, he had to be good. So he was testifying in front of Congress. We found this guy testifying in front of Congress, we found the recordings a couple years after he did it, where he was actually talking to House Oversight and telling them about all the potential leaks. And he actually took my file that he took and he told Congress that he found it and it was in the congressional record. And he talked about how he had was working with Dartmouth on an academic study where there was they had gotten twenty four million dollars from Dartmouth from the uh, Homeland Security. And Dartmouth is working with him to search the Internet. And these guys are monitoring four and a half million workstations a day. They're downloading. Uh, they can search a billion files a day. They've downloaded, I forget, like a hundred and some odd million files. And we were naive enough at the time, this is 2008 and nine, to go, oh, that's great. Today, you can't say a private company's monitoring. I mean, that's, it's, that's no way. You, you, I mean, we're much savvier. So he's fooling Congress. So when I found all this out, I let Congress know, House Oversight know, and House Oversight started an investigation. At the same time, uh, the whistleblower, me, brought out another whistleblower. Uh, the book came out, uh, and at the same time, the company collapsed because here comes the power and the iron fist of the, the agency. What the public doesn't understand is almost all these agencies have their own courts, their own investigators, they make their own rules. They are a judge, jury, and prosecutor. And Congresses from decades ago have ruled that they cannot be stopped or intervened with until they're finished. So what that means is you've given lawyers, um, you've given the, the playground bully complete access to you, and they've tied up the, the, you know, the guards. <laughs> and so they deposed 40 people, and they just ruined the reputation of the company they, through fear. They depose doctors, nurses, clients, vendors, former employees, current employees, and they scared the bejeez out of everybody because people don't need to know you did anything wrong. They just are afraid to get involved. And they don't want to be seen as your friend because they're afraid those big people will then turn on you. This was clearly a seek and destroy. And they did. We had 700,000 patients in the database and the company closed in January of 14. And at that point, then, Forbes and the Wall Street Journal had very small stories about it, but it had gotten back to Tyversa. And we were continuing our subpoenas, and we subpoenaed someone named Rick Wallace because his name had come up in an earlier deposition. And when we subpoenaed him, he, it, he kept delaying the, the, the date. And then one day in April of 14, he called me, very emotional, very upset, saying he had resigned the day before and that everything I said in my book was true. And yet it was even worse that what the company did was they worked with the FBI in child porn investigations in Pittsburgh and that they pulled out, you know, they used their software and, and to, to look for patient files. I'm sorry, look, looking for pornographers. But when they're off the clock and they're doing their own company work, they take the metadata from the bad guys and then they break into company computers looking for valuable files. And that's what they did to me. They broke into my company and took my file. They took the metadata from pornographers. They edited the file to make it look like it was out there. And it wasn't. And it worked for them like a charm because most companies were not medical. So they just write the check to make everything go away. And the company then would sell remediation services and monitoring services. And they're making a fortune. And they have a perfect track record because what they say exists is a lie and it doesn't exist. So I was a very big threat because I wasn't going along. And then I involved Congress because when this gentleman's name is Rick Wallace and he, you know, and he worked for Tyversa, but he had just resigned. And we brought him into House Oversight. And we were trying to get him criminal immunity because he participated. I just want to interject. That was a really powerful, when you went to Congress, that was a very powerful um, presentation you did. Thank you. It is amazing because, sadly, I mean, 
there's so many stories of how outrageous these people are. And, and, the, and part of the ironic protection of the, of the evil people and the corrupt is that, that what they'll do is so outrageous, it actually numbs the senses and people don't believe it. So, for example, I was testifying next to a guy named David uh, Ra- Rosher. Uh, or David Rosher, and, and sadly, he passed away two years ago. He ran two AIDS clinics in Chicago, and I could not bring any companies that were impacted by Rick Wallace's um, work because he was proffered and he didn't have criminal immunity. But just through fate, I found out about David's company in Chicago because my insurance carrier coincidentally has said had settled a lawsuit with that was against this this AIDS clinic because of Tyversa. So what we found out through the investigation and what he testified to is that Tyversa quote unquote found a file with a couple hundred AIDS patients, called David about the same time he called me in 2008, said we found your stuff and you know would you like to hire us or pay us? He had no interest in hiring them because he couldn't find any peer-to-peer software anywhere in his company. So he said no. And once again, Robert Bobek, to retaliate against customers that don't do what he wants, that he makes those guys look like the bad guy. And so he got a law firm in Pittsburgh and he had, he had the lawyer call the AIDS patients many of them closeted, many of them sick, many of them in marriages, and say, your stuff's been leaked out. Would you like to be part of a class action lawsuit? And six of the patients said yes. Many of the rest were just terrified. And they filed a class action lawsuit against the, la- against the AIDS clinics. And they got an out-of-court settlement, at which point Tyversa got part of that. So You see this shocking, and that's who testified next to me in Congress for the House Oversight Committee. And what was stunning, if you, and it's a good three hour long thing, and it's a lot to watch, but the cameras don't even show what's really going on. What's really going on is the complete indifference of, I have to say, almost everyone in the Democratic Party on this. That the only, and that was because it's a Republican that's bringing this to light. So if a Republicans bring it to light, it doesn't matter what it is. Death, destruction, extortion of an AIDS clinic, the, the annihilation of a medical laboratory, it doesn't matter. Politics is a blood sport there, and they just don't care. And it was terrifying to watch that because the other side brought it, they were going to bury it regardless of what it was. So they refused to look at the data, and they refused to listen to what was going on, and they refused to believe it. And they did all sorts of circle and confuse messages to the media to get the media off the scent to keep it buried. And it worked really well. And it was amazing to witness this. It, it, it was, it's just chilling to witness these congressmen that you see on television act like, you know, Frankenstein. It's really something. And then, uh, and so we, we couldn't get immunity for Rick uh, so he could spill the beans on the entire scheme because the Democrats would not allow a vote so that we get two thirds of the committee. So seven months, six months later, the Justice Department allowed immunity and Rick, you know, testified in mid 15. Now, the fact that that's when I observed the pol- politician and bureaucrats vicious game that were never taught in civics class about run the clock, bounce the ball, wait for, wait for power to change, wait for somebody to die, uh, confuse the media. The media is so easy to knock off the scent. It's, it's actually not a challenge. Um, because the, they're, they don't have money for investigative reporting. The reporters are incredibly young with no, no real life experience. And, and editors are afraid of the politicians cutting off story. So there is no, there, you know, I don't even think Watergate could actually happen today. Um, it, it is, there's just no, it, there's absolutely no journalism like there was back then. So when I thought, here I am testifying in front of House Oversight, and this is going to be the beginning of it, it wasn't. No one paid attention. The press didn't report it. Rick didn't get criminal immunity. Dave went back to Chicago. He passed away a year and a half, two years later, and nothing ever came out. And 
I kept pounding away and then Bloomberg wrote a big story and they thought I'd be all over Bloomberg and nothing ever happened. And then, you know, now Daryl Issa was term limited out of the committee and Jason Chaffetz, who's a complete waste, ended the ended the congressional investigation because John Boehner didn't want it going on. These are terrible people. I'm telling you, John Boehner and Jason Chaffetz are terrible people. And these are these are politicians where um, bloody bodies under the wheels of, of quote unquote justice just do not matter. And I think it's important that we, we get educated so we stop electing people like this. But as long as the stories are, 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 are muffled and crushed, we'll never know. And so, um, you know, we move, moved on. And it's interesting because so then I have all these lawsuits going on where I've I've been sued by the Federal Trade Commission in all of this. That lawsuit did not go away. And we won. We won the FT, the uh, FTC's court. And it's just so amazing, the living slow motion power of the government, even when they're wrong, because the Congresses have let the agencies have absolute power. So they have more power than their own internal courts. So 100 percent of the time when the FTC has lost to their own judge, the commissioners get to overturn it. And sure enough, he gave them a scathing message, a scathing ruling. He beat them up. They lost big and they just overturned him. So the big picture is that game took three years and millions of dollars. And that's why people settle, because there is no justice. There is no due process. And we just have lawyers. And I have to say, my father used to say, and I, I'm sorry, I wish I would have realized it was so true earlier. This is not true of all lawyers, but many, 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 and most in the government have killed their conscience and killed their logic before they've got a law school. Mm-hmm. And so they just have no, they're the walking dead. Uh, I don't know if you said it already, but. You know, those lawyers, you know, they just want to create more laws so they can get hired more. <laughs> that's what I no, that's heard. Not, that's a bureaucracy. That's right. It is nothing. I mean, it's just nothing. It's it's um, it's a terrifying thing and, it, and they can't talk about it. So these TV shows are a joke as far as what really goes on. The corruption is incredibly prevalent and the lives that are crushed uh, is way more than you think. And it's a, and it's all it's all about divide and conquer so that. If you lose the lottery, and I think it is just nothing but a lottery. I mean, I lost the lottery. There was nothing that we did wrong. As a matter of fact, it's being proven now that we did a lot. We did do nothing wrong. But um, I have resources that the vast majority of people don't have. And most people just get crushed and destroyed. But when you're crushed and destroyed by yourself and no one else was there to watch, no one's going to believe you in the media. I mean, the media is another arm unto itself, another culture on of itself. And it, it's really, it's terrible. So you have to wait a long, long time. And what I had going for me was my ability to make relationships in Washington to get pro bono legal defense. So that I had um, an agency called Cause of Action who focuses on outrageous government behavior and defending against it. And then when it got up the appeal process, um, then Ropes and Gray came in, and Ropes and Gray is, is the number one. They're a boutique, incredibly sophisticated, very good law firm. They're just phenomenal, and you know how much I hate lawyers. <laughs> and these guys are just awesome, and they yeah. because they they take their job seriously, their job. But they took my case pro bono because it's such a big deal. Because and, and, my, you know, these whistleblowing and these people that go pro bono. I mean, there are there are good lawyers. You know, I've talked to wonderful whistle whistleblower attorneys. So they yep. have so much character. They're out there. I think they're few and far between. That's right. That's exactly right. And and the thing is, you have to know is it's. I understand what happens to lawyers, and what happens to lawyers is judges, because judges have so much power. And I was talking to a lawyer this morning, and and he said, you know, he used to be on the he he clerked for a federal judge. Um, a cup for two years. And he said it was amazing. State courts, he said, you know, you've got the law and you've got the case. And he goes, and it'll be like, we have the law, we have the case. And then the judge will say, squirrel. I mean, what comes out of the judge's mouth makes absolutely no sense. They do what they want, no matter what. There's no one holding them accountable. They all cover for each other. They don't want to go after each other because they know 
that that then one day someone might come after them. So even if they're terrible, they all know who, who each other is. It's terrible, but they do nothing about it. It's incredibly hard to keep a bad judge accountable. It's terribly hard. Uh, and that's because it's always such a big, again, protection racket. And it's tough because I've met incredibly great judges. I know one that's retired, and I s- assume he's retiring because he just can't stand the reality of the bench. Uh, he's such a moral man. He's so outraged and disgusted by the behavior, the, the trickery and, and of what lawyering has become, which is truth goes missing. It's There's no morality. There's no right. There's no wrong. It's just a mad, wild, wild west. And so, but generally speaking, the higher up the, the, the ladder you get, the better the judges are. So there's be, tends to be better judges in the federal system. And, and, and the appellate courts, I've had, you know, pretty good judges. And we, we had the case, once, once the FTC overturned their own judge, then we finally, after th- three and a half, four years, finally get to an independent court. And this is the part that the public doesn't understand. So you get the EPA or all these agencies going, oh, we saved the water. We sa- we got rid of the bad guy. We did this. We did that. And they are nothing more. I, I, they're very much dealing with Mueller and Comey. You're, you're seeing these investigations that are nothing more except punishment through process. They're really not interested in going to court. Actually, Mueller got his head chewed off today in court in Virginia for his overreach and his arrogance. And the judge went right at him. But what the people have to notice is Mueller had has had years and, and these agencies have years to chase you down, to make you pay a pi- price, to wound you, to severely wound you. And you can't read into the future. And so that by the time you get to a judge, most people don't have the money or the fortitude or the stamina or the means to be able to do it. And these people know it. So instead of them trying to prove a case, they try to trick you on a technicality. And what's good about right now, even though it's awful to see, is that we are seeing it on the world stage. We're seeing Comey and Mueller act like these. Whether they're right or wrong, they are acting like judicial and, and, and uh, legal animals. And that's not what we signed up for. And, uh, I mean, everyone thinks OJ's guilty and everyone thinks he deserved a fair trial. Those are not mutually exclusive. And instead, you know, they try to chase you and do it. It's outrageous. And what they did to me was try to wear me down. And when I wrote the book, punish me and destroy the company. What they didn't know is that I would be able to get so much pro bono work and I would and, and that the, get the case to such a point where we actually that it has become the case in cybersecurity where we're going to be able to clip their wings if we win. Uh, because the judges were outraged. I mean, the oral argument, the judge said, and he still hasn't made his decision, by the way. It's been almost a year now. But he asked them if they worked with crooks. If they, they, he, he said, you participated in shakedowns. It appears that, that the threat of, of being turned over to you uh, would make people buy this company's services. And there was nothing there. And the other judge said, it's like if a tree fell down the woods and no one was there to hear it, why are we here? So um, you, to climb through that decade-long experience and actually win over an agency, there's still no such thing as a win because the agency doesn't care if they lose at this stage. They have a horror story, and they want to win by having everyone horrified. They want everyone else they go after to, ha- to call up their lawyers, and the lawyers tell the, their, their, whoever they're investigating to be careful and to settle because the agency's crazy. Look at the terrible case they had against LabMD and Doherty. Look at how they got their head handed to them and look how they brought the case anyway. I mean, this is all about fear and submission. I call it the 21st century version of the 16th century where they used to decapitate someone and put their head on a spike and let it rot on the bridge. And the reason they did that was they want to terrify everyone else in the town into submission and compliance because they couldn't get to everybody. So they use mass fear. And that's what the agencies do. They use huge fear and story. And um, and so it's tough because I, I didn't think I'd get an FBI 
that wasn't really going to work. The FBI raided Tyversa in 2016. They closed the criminal investigation. I just FOIA'd their uh, their information. They have 455,000 pages of documents on Tyversa. 455,000. And it's not impossible that they don't want to have the case out because it's incredibly embarrassing to them that they work with criminals. So what we're seeing is such a politicized, um, we're seeing parts of the government that are absolutely not supposed to be politicized that wear the label of truth and justice that are, are terrifying because they're anything but right now. I don't think it's always been this way, but we're at a really dark time and it's really important that people get educated about it in, in a sort of more balanced way to, to understand how this could happen. Um, so that's sort of, I mean, that's where we're at now. So now we're at this point where we've, we've discovered only through a lot of FOIA documents the last four or five months that there have been some internal players doing some bad actions, that that the, the software that was used to steal my file was not LimeWire. And we will keep pushing and pushing and pushing to crack open discovery to find out, um, you know, what really happened and prove and prove it. And now people are going, oh, you are right. And, 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 you know, not that great of a treat, I have to tell you. Uh, but I do it because I don't want anyone else to have to go through it. It's a really, really, really important thing. Mm-hmm. Well, we have 20 more minutes so we can go into some other areas if you like. Maybe talk about yeah. that. Judicial, yeah. you know, the, ju- the, ju- the judicial system. Well, I mean, do you want to ask me questions or do you want me to just sort of give you my opi- opinion and opine on it? Or what would you <laughs> sure. like? Sure. You give me your opinion. This is what you've been well, doing. Well, I will talk about what surprised me. I mean, and I'm not naive. I mean, again, I, my father was an investigator. He was not a, like a uniform cop with a car with lights. He was a, a, an inspector, an investigator. He was a trench coat guy that, that solved murders mm-hmm. in Detroit. So I, I, I didn't have a, a, a naive perspective, but I really still... I mean, we are taught this fairy tale. And, and you know who told, who also told me this was I took a class from, from Antonin Scalia in 2013 on the separation of powers. And there are about 40 people there. And I had seen him a few times that year. So I had a one-on-one with him for just about four or five minutes. And I asked him about taking a case against Tyversa up to the Supreme Court. And he said to me that it hasn't been the Supreme Court's job in over 100 years to fix the mistakes of the courts below them. That's not what their role is. And he says, and he can't tell me how many times he flips through cases and thinks to himself, my goodness, they really screwed this one up. And so what Scalia really was, was horrified of judges. He was horrified of the power that judges have And this is about human beings. Judges are human beings. And many, 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 not all, but many, many cannot do not have the character or the stamina uh, or, or, you know, or the energy for that tough of a job. And they then start relying on their power and they do terrible things, but there's no accountability. So they get lazy. They get unfair. They get angry. And he was terrified of that more than anything else. And he said the public sits there and thinks, oh, we'll just have, we'll elect people to make laws. And then the laws will be enforced by the courts. And the courts will take care of everything and it will all be good. And he said, you know, what could be further from the truth? He goes, courtrooms are terrible places where bad things happen to people every single day. And see, my problem is no one understands that. And if you don't understand it, we can't fix it. We don't fix it by just beating up on the judges. You know, we have to take a step back and educate people. We have to have a, I I always say in the past three years, I've said there has not been a completely open and transparent civics book in this country since the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. Because when the administrative, when the administrative agency started and they had all those powers, that's not in any book. The books are always about legislative, executive, and judicial, and that's it. And it's a fairy tale because all these agencies have now had a, had a century to grow and sort of 
hone their skills and create their loopholes and their trap doors and their strategies. And they are very, very, very big, scary things. And they're rising up and having a big fit about Donald Trump. And when you've got a populace that, that, that's not educated, that's not stupid, it's not educated. And there's a difference. And most people don't roll through court. And most people don't want to know. And so that's a really, it's a really ripe, ground to be extremely abusive and it takes a special character to be a judge and not be abusive and we have way more judges than we have people with character <laughs> and and so and you know and they all know who each other is and they all know they know but you know it's kind of a silent thing they really don't go after each other the self-policing of judges and lawyers is an abject utter failure and um so you know it, it it's tough because um it, have you ever seen an industry that spends more time congratulating itself than judges and lawyers? No. You know, I mean, you go into these courtrooms and there's these portraits of these judges like they're gods. You know, mm. and I, I, I find it outrageous. They're even sitting higher than everyone else. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and, and look, people, human beings that are gods are humble and they're not seeking attention and they understand and and human beings that think they're gods that want to be put on a, t a higher perch are are terrifying. Uh, so it, it's 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 fascinating um, and it's important and it's scary. But at the same time, I think uh, when I started writing the book in twelve versus now, boy, the world's a different place. I mean, so many people now. It's it's so my story's so believable. People are so of course. And that is, and I, I mean, I am the one that they all come to, right? So, you know, I can, the, the, there's so much more openness and believability now than there was, which is kind of sad, you know, because back in, in right after Obama won again, uh, there was just, it was so touchy. I mean, my book was called The Devil Inside the Beltway, and I don't think the word Obama's in there one time. Mm -hmm. And everyone was like, is this about Obama? You know, and liberals would get very offended because I had some of the American flag on the cover. And they just assume it's an attack on their on their sweet lord. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not, it is nothing to do with that. It's 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 a bigger picture of the. My gosh, we're so screwed up because, I still have to say, I am I am still as stunned today as I was ten years ago, that someone will come in and assault, and exploit, cancer patients, and sleep like a baby. And I don't know why. I mean, maybe you have some ideas in your experience. I don't know why, but it just doesn't grab people. Maybe they can't relate to it or they're not in medicine, but it's like too much for the press to take in. It's too much for the media to take in. I cannot tell you the number of times people go, I can't believe you're not on CNN or Fox News. And I'm like, these people, the, these producers are 25 years old. They've got no breadth of frame of reference or, or breadth of experience. And how are you going to pack this into six minutes? Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, it's hard. And it's a great defense. It's a great, it's a great, if you're a criminal, it's a great thing to know. Yeah, I just wonder if there's some other, you know, entities or, you know, working in the same field who are trying to quiet you, you know, I don't know if you said that one, but. Well, I don't, you know, it's, I'm not that, I'm, the one thing is I'm a terrible victim. I mean, I, I have, I mean, I, <laughs> A successful businessman. I don't fight back. I mean, I fight back like crazy. You're not going to break me. Uh, I, I am not. I'm not sympathetic, and I don't want to be sympathetic. I'm doing this. I'm like trying to. And this, I get really outraged because I'm like, this is not about me, and it, this is about you and this country and this government and what they'll do to you. You probably have three degrees of separation from one of those 700,000 patients of this medical facility that diagnoses cancer that they destroyed. And they didn't destroy it. They destroyed it without concern. And they would do it again today. And this is fascinating. I, I wrote about this in my book. I found it fascinating that they really, really, truly didn't care. And I thought, what is it about people that do such terrible things and they don't care? And I don't know if you or your listeners remember the Milgram studies, but that's what I really, there's this studies out of Yale in the fifties and it, and it was very controversial and they've, 
they've tried they've tried to debunk it many times throughout the world since but it's where it's about 60 to 70 percent of all the humans on the planet will consciously harm another person because a superior and authority told them to do so I was just talking about that just, I believe, you know, a week ago it was in a conversation, you know, we, it was astounding to us. It does, you know, in my circles, it, it shows up, it comes up quite often. And this is why, you know, we have to understand how many people, I mean, I don't want to the babe out the bathwater here, but it's, it's a lot of people are dangerous. Uh, they, they, and, and, and it's not self-preservation on, you know, stealing a piece of cheese here. We're talking, we're talking pain and, and, and harm and destruction. And, um, and the lawyers themselves that work in these things, it's such an echo chamber. It's such a, it's such a group think it's, it's all about subcultures, uh, and, and that brainwashing. So within the FTC, they're very brainwashed because everyone has to bring meaning and mission to their life. And nothing safer than to work in Washington, DC and go into a big fancy building. And you feel like you're doing the Lord's work and you're in this echo chamber and the, and they're out saving consumers, saving consumers. And 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 if you and what they knew that I didn't know is that if I got up there and I, I, I screamed, railed against the machine, and even with the evidence I had, the media is not going to report it because the media is afraid of the machine. Bloomberg thought it was going to. There's spread. also the, the belief that it's controlling the machine, so to speak. It's controlling the media. It is controlling the media. It's controlling the media through fear. I mean, there's two things that controls. It's it's either they control them through fear or story. You know, I have a fr- I, I had someone in my family. Uh, I, I'm sorry, a very close friend of mine's family member uh, who I knew when she was a teenager turned out to be a very prominent producer at 60 Minutes. I did not know this till my book came out. So here's someone I've known for all these years, very close with her family was a Paul Bear at one of their family members' funeral. Very, very close. And yet, she went to CBS. She started working early. She went in with Obama when he was completely unknown and thought no way would he win. And so then she's tight with him all the way through his, his um, presidency, and she's at every Christmas party. And she's executive. She's the executive producer every time he's on 60 Minutes. Do you He's think a they lawyer, touched, too, you know. He was right. a you lawyer. Think, you think she touched this, my story, the 10-foot pole? Absolutely not. And the selective perception was uncomfortable and outrageous and shameful. I mean, it's and it's easy to say right now because so much has been proven now. But to me, the bigger picture is the systemic failure through all, this, all the safety nets that were supposed to be there, and they have holes in them. The Department of Justice, the FBI, the courts, the judges, Congress. I mean, I go to, I mean, how often does one go get pro bono defense? Then how often does one get a congressional investigation by a House Oversight Committee? And then how often does one get a actual hearing? And then a 93 page report. And I have beat up the National Law Review to the point that it's a joke about, and they've brought in some good pieces, but this one reporter, I, I, I poke him going, have you read the Daryl Issa report yet? I mean, it's at a point of ridiculousness. He hasn't read it. Why is there such a pushback? Then you go to the FBI raids, and then they, they don't have the resources for the case. There's 455,000 pages. You know, mm-hmm. and you, ha- you have so many systems. Just, I mean, we've been in, in, in two cases in Pittsburgh for four years. And neither judge has allowed discovery yet. And when you see judges go off the rail and you see how there's nothing that you can do about it, that's why they're up there smirking. You know, it, this is not, it's not what we're taught. You know, it's a lottery. As far as getting a good judge, it's a lottery. Because there's no accountability for them unless they go really, 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 really off the rails. And by the time they do that, it's already like, you know, it's like catching a serial killer on the 500th kill. You still have 499 victims that have never had their day in court. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it's really, it's, 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 and, and you, I don't want to sound too scary uh, because people don't like that. And we have to get people to understand and listen. 
But this is a, we have a real problem. Well, that's agreed. I know enough to know that's absolutely true. Yeah. And, and how do we get people? So, so my book, you know, and my next book is not, I, it's not written to lawyers. It's not written to judicial. It's not written to politics. It's written to the public. You know, I want want to, I want to edutain because if I just tell them it's too scary, you know, so I wrote the book like a novel so that, you know, the phone's ringing, but it's never answered in one chapter. And you always want to know who's doing. And these characters were not hard to write because they're all they're so true. It's just these characters are something. And so, um, you know, and at the same time, it's not all me. Look at how things have changed. Look at how the cynicism. I think it's a healthy cynicism. Look at the cynicism now that we see. People really think something's wrong. They know it. I think they, that's healthy considering how it's been this establishment. You know, there needs to be that. People need to question. People need to demand change. And I think the general public needs to push. They need to push because, and they have allowed, I mean, we have been, I, I say our patriotism has been exploited. Our trust has been violated. Oh, our constitution has been exploited. Or, it's or, mm-hmm. And and the complete lack of accountability. It, it's it's like a it's like a, a slow moving mindless mob because there's no one person that thinks they're to blame. So everyone in that machine, they all do their little part of I say they all do their part of whistling past the graveyard. They all do their part looking away. So what I don't support, know. What support are you getting? I mean, well, other than the ones you, other than what you've stated so far. Well, I mean, I think I, I you know, I, I, I haven't, I, I, when you're at a war, and I'm still at a war, uh, you, you, one of the things is there's surprises all the time, and you have to deal with imperfection, and you're spinning 20 plates, and some are going to break, and there's nothing you can do about it. So I haven't been that focused on getting support. I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of, a lot of uh, a speaking, and a lot of, a lot of media and cybersecurity, but I've seen, I, I, again, I'm a terrible victim. I, I don't come across as someone that is a victim. Um, I, I have good assets. I am a white male CEO. I have my own airplane. I am not a victim. So, and even though this terrible thing happened to me, a lot worse has happened to others. So um, I don't, you know, my idea of support is people banging the, the gong about the story and that it, it happens to everybody all the time. What's weird about this is that there aren't many people that were in the sweet spot I was in that actually could do something about it and be effective. Mm-hmm. And so that's the hard part. I mean, well, I we have a co- whistleblower, whistleblower organizations completely ignored me. You called me. I was shocked because I've tried to get not not me in whistleblower organizations, but I've tried to get Rick help because Rick Wallace is is a true, true whistleblower inside who took. I mean, he had, to, he had, you know, he put his criminal potential on the line, did get immunity, but they've ruined his life. They have gone after him to ruin him, and they have been absolutely successful. Mm. Yeah, and that's always heartbreaking for me to hear. You know, sometimes people can um, get their lives back, and, and oftentimes, like I said earlier, they, well, in the intro, they're the catalyst for change, and sometimes it takes a little bit of time. We just have a couple of minutes, so would you like to give your links? Sure, sure. Um, well, the book is called The Devil Inside the Beltway, and honestly, it's it sells as well as today as it did the day it came out because it's still a living story that's still going on. And it, it really is a, a, a novel, a true novel about how the government works. I mean, they're, they're, so it's very, it, it's fascinating. So um, that book is an audiobook and ebook and hardcover and softcover, and it's at Amazon and all those four domains. And it's at iTunes and it's at Barnes & Noble if you want to order it. But I really, if you know, iTunes or, uh, or Amazon are, are the way to go. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, my, my website is michaeljdoherty.com, but since most people can't spell that on the run, I also have it. <laughs> it, it is it, tricky. It, <laughs> I, I, when I was putting it into my cell phone, it is a little tricky, your last name. Well, there's a, and there's a lot of Doherty's, which I, there's a lot of Michael. As a matter of fact, I went to the University of Michigan. There's a Michael Doherty I graduated the exact same year with. He's in the music school. He's a very well-known musician, and he grabbed all the good links before me. <laughs> you have the J, though. You have your middle yeah, initial the, to separate you. So, 
The devil inside the beltway.com. The devil inside the beltway.com will get you there. And then you can do Facebook and Twitter. But, you know, really, I like your YouTube. I really do oh, like your you. YouTube. And there's a YouTube series. At the, if you go to the website, I, there's an eight series, and each one is like three, four minutes. Uh, the book is in TV series development. I'm, I'm slowly working on that because I won't give anyone else a bunch of control so they can change it. Uh, and the, the there we go. Show's oh, in closing up here. And I just want to say you can check out my website, whistleblowerheroes.org. And don't forget to take care and help out this station freedomslips.com and you'll see the donor.